Very pleased to introduce next uh, Matt Myers. He is president and one of the founders of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, which, as I mentioned yesterday, a very strong advocate for tobacco control around the world uh, for almost two decades. He has been on the front lines of the fight against tobacco in the United States and, and around the world. Um, many of the major conflicts in tobacco control are things that he's been involved in, fighting to get our Food and Drug Administration jurisdiction over cigarettes and smokeless tobacco products, helping states in the U.S. sue the tobacco industry. Those lawsuits coughed up a huge trove of documents which were very helpful in future litigation, including for some individual plaintiffs and many other lawsuits, the settlements from which uh, were used to help in tobacco control efforts. Uh, in 1999, Mr. Myers was appointed to the first Tobacco Advisory Committee at WHO. He's been active on the world tobacco stage ever since. He's received many awards for his work, including the American Cancer Society Medal of Honor. So we're very pleased to have him this morning. Mr. Myers? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. I want to welcome all of you. Have any of you ever been to a world conference before? No. Have any of you ever covered tobacco? Yes, yes. Um, I really am delighted to be here and to try to give you an early orientation. Um, Judith Mackay, who's speaking after me, will talk to you much more about tobacco and health, um, so you get a better sense of that. My goal today is really to give you just a brief introduction of three major topics. Um, the first is to talk to you a little bit about tobacco marketing, how the tobacco industry markets, particularly to young people. Um, the overall theme that you will see, and it's a pretty stunning one for those of us who've done this work for a long period of time, is that what we're seeing in emerging markets or low and middle income countries is the tobacco industry using the exact same tactics they used in the United States and wealthy nations in which they're no longer allowed to use in any of those countries. They simply shifted the marketing tactics from country to country. In many respects, they sort of remind me of a two-year-old before you have a moral compass. You keep doing what's wrong until someone says no. Um, and in this case, you have to keep doing it in every country. The second is to talk about litigation. And I want to break that conversation down into two different areas. There's a logical thought pattern that says, given how dangerous tobacco is, why haven't the tobacco industry been sued more? Why haven't they been forced to pay more in damages? Why haven't we, the good guys, been able to use the courts as more of a weapon against them? And then the second piece of that, <clears throat> um, which tells you a lot about the tobacco industry, is to talk about how the tobacco industry has used courts in litigation in order to prevent countries from moving forward with the most reasonable forms of um, tobacco control measures. First, a little bit about the campaign. The Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids um, is the globe's largest public health advocacy organization dedicated exclusively to tobacco use. We're about 18 years old, although some of us have worked in tobacco control for many years before that. Our work outside the United States is very much focused on trying to prevent the tobacco industry to do in low and middle income countries what it has done throughout the developed world in wealthy countries first. That's an enormous task. In doing that, we're lucky to have been supported by first um, Mike Bloomberg and Bloomberg Philanthropies. In 2007, Bloomberg, Mike Bloomberg and Bloomberg Philanthropies launched what is the largest tobacco control advocacy effort globally ever formed. The Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids is fortunate enough to have been one of five major partners in that effort. The other partners, and you're going to hear from all of them during the course of the next day or two, are the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the United States, whose task is to try to help governments develop systems for monitoring and measuring what's going on in their country. The second is the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health to make sure that the best in terms of public health research is brought to this effort. The third is the World Health Organization, 
um, because of its obvious role in working with governments across the globe. Um, and the fourth is the, the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease and the World Lung Foundation um, to work with governments throughout. The Bloomberg Initiative focuses very, very heavily on low and middle income countries, and it does it in a very systematic way. Its top priorities are the five countries around the globe with the most tobacco users. It's a very simple formula. And therefore, that means that the five top priority countries are Russia, Bangladesh, India, China, and Indonesia. What you also see is that if you add in the 10 next low and middle income countries with the most smokers, you have two thirds of the world's tobacco users in just 15 countries. And that's where we focus the bulk of our energy outside of the United States. Let me talk now a little bit about why it is necessary to have such an extraordinary and active effort. The first thing goes to very much the behavior of the tobacco industry and how it goes about marketing its products. There's a core issue for you to understand. Today, we're dealing with an industry that is quantitatively and qualitatively different than any other industry in the world. And that is fundamentally important to understand. Not only are tobacco products the only consumer product that, when used exactly as intended, kills one half of its long-term users, it's addictive, and virtually all new users start as children and the tobacco industry has known this for over 60 years. That's a critically first step. Second, any other industry that was told that its products are the major cause of cancer, as serious a cause of heart disease and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and a major cause of birth defects and problems, would have thought about changing its product. The tobacco industry developed a strategy to deceive the public and continue to market to consumers all across the globe in order to continue to make profits, even knowing the nature of its products. And therefore, to do that, you had to use all conceivable means. Anything a government would let you do in order to continue to market your product, the tobacco industry has done. And that has include, included the most extraordinary, most blatant, deception of consumers about the health effects of its products, about the purpose and goals of its marketing, and about what it itself knew about tobacco products and its harm. It has also aggressively targeted the most vulnerable communities in each and every country in which it works. And what does that mean? Increasingly, that means the poor. It means the population that can't read. It means the population that in many countries doesn't have enough money to spend on food, but instead gets them addicted to tobacco products. And then last, it means one of the most sophisticated, if not the most sophisticated, effort of misusing lawyers in the legal system in every country to delay and obfuscate um, its behavior. So let's talk a little bit about marketing. Um, for the last 20 years, smoking and the use of tobacco in the wealthiest nations in the world has been on the decline. You would think that that would cause a tremor throughout the tobacco industry. Well, while it didn't make them happy, it did not also cause them to lose sleep. And why? Well, there's a very good reason. Here's British American tobacco. We should not be depressed simply because the total free world market appears to be declining. Within the total market, there are areas of strong growth, particularly in Asia and Africa. It's an exciting prospect. As we look at countries and see disease rates and low smoking rates, we see one thing. They see a potential market. Philip Morris, what was its strategy? This is Jeff Bible, who was then the CEO of Philip Morris globally. Expand globally to addict new consumers. Keep in mind that more than three quarters of the Earth's population lives in emerging markets. 
For the most part, those people barely know our brands. And then, quote, believe me, that's going to change dramatically in the next five years. Six, six short years ago, we claimed 10% of the world demand for cigarettes. Today, our global share has climbed to 15%. Imagine what the number will look like in, say, 10 to 20 years after we've made significant inroads in markets now only opening up to us. What's the impact of that? There is, epidemiologically, a consistent pattern, and that is when you see a country with low smoking rates, you also, by and large, see a country with low cancer rates, lower heart disease rates, and when you factor out other factors, actually better health um, birth outcomes. But you can track it based on the length of time it takes for cancer to become a serious health problem. And those charts, um, circles, excuse me, those lines that you see provide the stages of the tobacco epidemic. I've highlighted purposely Africa, China, Japan, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and North Africa. Because in every one of those countries, we are at the early stage. Smoking rates are still lower than they got to in the wealthiest countries. What it also means is that we are seeing a dramatic rise year by year in cancer rates as that epidemic grows. What does it mean for public health? It means that if we don't stop the growth in these countries here, we are going to see cancer rates and heart disease rates absolutely devastate countries that can least afford those health concerns. There is nothing in public health epidemiology that is more guaranteed. We can chart for you what those disease rates will look like. And if you want just a sense of that, take a country like China, where today you have approximately a million people a year dying from tobacco use, a horrific number. If smoking rates simply don't change, those numbers will double and triple as the epidemic moves along that spectrum there. So that for China, for example, what you're looking at is an explosion of death, if, even if it doesn't get worse, if it just doesn't get better. Now talk a little bit about Africa, where in most countries, smoking rates are well below 10%. If those rates follow the trajectory of wealthy countries, you are going to see an explosion of cancer in those countries unlike anything the continent has ever seen before. And what will it do to the healthcare systems that are being developed to deal with other diseases? It will completely and utterly overwhelm it. That's what's at stake with stopping the growth of the epidemic in those countries. The tobacco industry sees it totally different. We see an explosion of death and disease. They see a marketplace. And what are they doing? What we're seeing is they're doing exactly the same things that they did in the UK, in Europe, and in the United States in the 1940s, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, until the government stopped them from doing so. It's the use of advertising, promotion, and sponsorship targeted at young kids, even while they say they never market to kids. The development of new products designed largely to appeal to the young, to people in, uh, young women in many countries where they're suddenly seeing independence and freedom and having disposable income, and pricing strategies designed explicitly to make cigarettes affordable to the poorest of the poor. Get them addicted buying one stick at a time, and you've got them forever. So, you know, let's look at some of the tactics. You know, in the early days in some of the wealthiest countries, we saw them using actually sports marketing, an amazing inconsistency, but it didn't bother them at all. It grew um, through the 1960s. Matter of fact, it grew in the 1970s when they began sponsoring tennis around the globe, around there. And what are we seeing now? What we're seeing is the same exact thing in countries like Africa, in Indonesia, we've seen them sponsor youth um, soccer in recent years. I mean, imagine uh, 
a less congruous connection, youth soccer and running with cigarettes. Yet, the imagery works, and it works powerfully as you see changes in behavior. What about music? The clarion call to young people around the globe. Began it in the 20s, in, updated it in the 60s and 70s, and now what we're finding, again, all across Africa, all across Latin America, and in many Southeast Asian countries, sponsorship of rock concerts and other music events attended almost exclusively by young people. Marketing through fashion. This is particularly insidious given the low smoking rates for cultural reasons of women in so many low and middle income countries. And yet, what we're seeing here is an explosion of them using modern um, fashion to reach young girls. If you want to know how well it works, um, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, fewer than 10% of Russian women smoked. And by and large, they were older. Go to Russia today, and you'll see that close to 25% of Russian women smoke. And it is the young 18 to 30-year-old, um, well-dressed, wanting to look Western, wanting to look modern. And what's the key part of that? It's a long, thin, white cigarette. Um, it's pure marketing that has transformed that. As a net result, Russia went from a country with one of the highest smoking rates among men to a country with the highest combined smoking rate anywhere in the globe. And as we think back now to some of the other countries we're talking about here in low and middle income countries, think about the smoking rates among women in your countries. China, under 5%. Africa, most countries well under 5%. Um, in many Southeast Asian countries where you have a serious problem with the use of smokeless tobacco, you are beginning to see modern marketing. If that takes off the impact on the health of women and therefore the impact on the health of women going through childbirth will be absolutely and completely devastating. It is not only preventable, it is consciously being caused by an industry that knows exactly what it is doing. And what about the countries that have tried to stop this kind of marketing and imagery? What we've seen is the most insidious kind of brand stretching where traditional advertising for cigarettes isn't allowed, but suddenly you're seeing um, Will's clothing, um, Will's products, um, John Player's products. For those of us who have a passion about worrying about what Marlboro does, I've seen travel agencies that call come to Marlboro country. The same thing for camel stores around the globe. Appealing the same images, it is actually stunning. The same images are actually successful in country after country. Because adolescents, boys and girls, want to be independent, they want to be rugged, they want to be individualistic, and they want to be exactly like all of their peers. Um, and the tobacco industry uses marketing to create the impression that that's what the story is. And why? It's a very simple reason. The one harm they've got with, the, one problem they got with their product is it can, kills off their consumers. So they almost more than any other industry has to find replacements. And they know the replacements are young people and they have figured out how to get them with the images, with the sale of single cigarettes that youth can afford. So most recently what we've seen is Philip Morris International, which proclaims loudly on its website that it does not market to kids. It does not want kids to use its product, but has designed one of the most successful advertising campaigns aimed particularly at adolescents, rebellious adolescents, with the message, don't be a maybe. In other words, don't be too chicken, don't be a coward, don't be afraid to take the risk. Don't be afraid to step out and be independent. Don't be a maybe, be a Marlboro. It's time for action. The images are all designed and has been introduced in low and middle income country after low and middle income country, Indonesia, Philippines, Brazil, Indonesia again. In some of these ads we have found outside of elementary schools giving a very clear message. 
You want to send a strong message about what a powerful teenager you are? We've got the solution for you. <clears throat> and it's every place the kids play. There is no place that is forbidden to them unless the government prevents them from doing it. That's the core lesson here. So if you want to take a single message away about this industry, it is very simply that this is an industry that will do anything, say anything, use any tool in order to market its product, no matter how deadly its product may be. And to succeed, it has learned long ago that its replacement smoker is a kid. It is virtually always a kid. And whether it's in Africa, China, the United States, you let them do it, they'll do it, and they'll succeed. And then they very carefully and cleverly know, if we're too much of a pariah, we won't be able to get away with this. If no politician will be able to defend themselves on some principle. So what do we see? We see enormous so-called, quote, corporate social responsibility. Never has an industry used so-called good works to, as a clear tactic in order to continue to do business as usual. Um, what does it mean? It's often donations um, to charities, donations to youth organizations, donations to schools, um, often coming in um, after a catastrophe um, in order to provide assistance. And then, of course, very heavily marketing that. Not sure that I did that. I couldn't have done that. It works. Can you mind it for a moment? I just checked to see if the battery is still destroyed. Yeah, I know that that's what you're talking okay. about. Okay, sure. Yes, we are plugged in. Okay. So, you know, there's a very simple message for this for anybody who covers the tobacco industry. Um, and that is don't be misled. They know exactly what they're doing. Don't be misled that what they're doing in your country is exactly what they've done successfully elsewhere. Don't be misled when they say they don't want to market to kids. They know exactly what they're doing. And their own internal documents say that clearly and explicitly with regard to that. And that is one of the key things that we've learned from litigation. So let me talk a little bit about that. And in talking, sure. Oh, that's, it's, it's a great question, thank you. So with the brand stretching for Wills, for example, is this the kind of diversification we should be encouraging? Actually, if they were interested in diversifying into clothing and other products, they wouldn't call it the Wills line. Um, this is not a diversification from their point of view. They don't care if the Wills style clothing makes a penny. The Wills style clothing is designed explicitly to be able to continue to advertise the Wills brand to make it cool and chic to young people. It has nothing to do with diversification in their mind. So if they were really interested in, in diversifying into other product lines like clothing or the other items that I listed, they would come up with a different brand name in order to market it um, in that notion. So you, you shouldn't be confused. The kind of things that we're talking about are not a legitimate effort at diversification. They are a conscious effort to be able to get around your marketing rules and restrictions. And that's particularly true in India where we see it all over the place. Um, that it's simply designed to keep wills cool among young people when they, can't, um, when they can no longer project those ads out with those kinds of images. And we've seen them do that with Marlboro, we've seen them do it with Camel, we've seen them do it with John Players, we've seen them do it with a number of other brands around the globe. This isn't diversification from their point of view. And 
they were diversifying. So they took on Wills. So they took on Wills and they launched that particular line in terms of lifestyle. So isn't that, uh, you know? If you take a look at their profit and loss and what they're doing with it, none of that is designed to become a profit center. So it's, it's, it's about as shallow an effort. It is not designed to be a profit center. It is designed much more in terms of picking locations, in terms of marketing, to continue to continue to project the same exact imagery. So if they're not just doing the same name, but if you look at the imagery they've projected for a particular brand, whether it's Wills, Marlboro, John Players, down the list, what you will see is that the imagery is virtually identical to the imagery that was no longer permitted. And then when you look at the marketing plan, you will see that the marketing plan doesn't have any effort in it designed to turn this into a large profit-making component of their business. It is simply a marketing arm of the tobacco business. So if, for example, they really were serious about this, yes, we would all be enthusiastic and, and encourage that. But that's not really what's going on. This is doing what they've done so often before when you look at their documents, saying one thing and doing the other and assuming we're too stupid to figure it out. And these brand extensions help, right, in terms of... Uh, they uh, help with the imagery completely. Help. Yeah, it's exactly what they do. Um, if, you, if you take a look at, at the Will's imagery in the stores you've seen and the ads you've seen in India there, you see it is the exact image that, uh, of how they used to be selling Will's cigarettes. So it's, it's not different at all. One way to probably look at it globally uh, is that, you know, wherever they're selling their cigarettes, are these the geographies they are doing this kind of diversification? Or are the geographies also different? Don't yeah. you think that would probably establish what you're saying, you know, in a way? Well, you can take a look at the marketplace of who they're marketing to. And they're marketing to what I call as the replacement smokers. Um, it's the image to reach the, re the replacement smoker. Whether or not that is the population you would most want to go after for the particular product whatsoever. Um, but it's, uh, we've looked at their internal documents when available in various countries, and in no case do you see any indication that those brand extensions are about a new product line designed to lead to long-term profitability to replace the profitability of the cigarettes. Um, that they're being marketed to. Let me talk a little bit about litigation, because um, it's often misunderstood, uh, but in, be increasingly important, um, with two, in two different frames for you. The first is, I'm often asked, given how deadly this product is, um, why isn't, why haven't the tobacco companies been held accountable, responsible for it? And then second, um, how does how does the tobacco industry see the use of courts in countries around the world as its own weapon? And those are two really important questions to understand and become increasingly important. So first, why haven't the, hasn't the tobacco industry been held more accountable? And what has been the result of litigation designed to do that? You know, it's a perfectly logical question because you know, we have known in varying degrees about the health harms of smoking since 1950. Um, it was fully and solidly documented um, by 1964. There, could, there was no longer any other scientific doubt. And so lawyers naturally assumed that this was a perfect place in countries that allow litigation for people who sell products that hurt people to bring those cases. Um, and it's one of the earliest signs of how the tobacco industry was going to play these games. The United States, which is probably the most litigious country in the world, and, and I should um, acknowledge I was a trial lawyer before I did this work, uh, on that sense. Um, you know, back 60 years ago in the United States, there was a legal principle that said if you sell a product that is dangerous to people when you use it, you are automatically responsible for the harms that it causes. If you want to build it into your, your profit and loss mo, you know, statement, you can do that. Um, but then there was a subtle change made. Just before our first Surgeon General's report on smoking came out, the subtle change came in a document that we call the Restatement of Torts. The title is really not important. But it, it's um, a guideline 
that covers US law about when people will be responsible. And suddenly there was a change in that before the Surgeon General's report came out. And what the change said was, if a product's danger was obvious, then a consumer who was injured by it could only recover damages if they could show fault by the manufacturer. Fault meaning that it, the product was inherently dangerous, that the manufacturer wouldn't be responsible, that you had to show that the manufacturer either made it more dangerous or knew that it was dangerous and lied to you about that. And with that subtle change, suddenly the ability to sue tobacco companies when you got various diseases became much, much harder. Now, what we have subsequently learned was that the chair, and when I say subsequently, 50 years later, learned that the chairman of that committee had been serving as a consultant to the major tobacco industry at the time that that was done. So the net result was we saw an early surge of cases in the United States that sought to claim that tobacco companies should pay for people when they got lung cancer and other serious diseases and were long-term smokers. The tobacco industry immediately responded to those because lawyers thought these were going to be easy cases to win and that we'd be able to hold the tobacco companies responsible. And by holding them responsible, we'd be able to change their behavior. It didn't happen. What happened was the tobacco companies used the new change in the law and uncertainty about science um, in order to defend these cases. Um, and there's a brand new movie um, out um, that's actually just out that talks about doubt as the weapon of industries that produce dangerous products. Here you have the chief lawyer for Philip Morris um, doing what the industry has done for years and years. I'm a lawyer, I have a client who's just died of lung cancer after 40 years of smoking and otherwise living a basically healthy life. The tobacco company comes into the courtroom and says, you can't prove that her lung cancer wasn't really caused by the fact that she lived five miles away from a chemical plant, or because she lived in a city with heavy degrees of smog, or because she did something else. Um, and they've said this to juries and judges. Here's one. We're not going to tell you smoking doesn't cause throat cancer, because they can't say that. Um, but inhaling large amounts of sawdust also increases the chance. Um, where did her cancer come from? The answer is that nobody can tell us. There are still mysteries about cancer with regard to it. Or um, do you believe that cigarette smoking is addictive? This answer requires thought. Pharmacologically, my answer is no. If they are behaviorally addictive or habit-forming, they are more like caffeine or, in my case, gummy bears. Uh, I love gummy bears. Um, this is a C, the president of Philip Morris. I love gummy bears. I want gummy bears, and I like gummy bears, and I eat gummy bears, and I don't like it when I don't eat my gummy bears, but I'm certainly not addicted to them. Now, you laugh, but he says it with a straight face. Um, and he has lawyers who he's paying an absolute fortune to uh, to say it with a straight face. And by and large, those companies are up against lawyers who don't have those kinds of resources, don't have access to the kind of doctors who can come in. And in some of these diseases, and practically every one of them other than lung cancer, making not just the connection, but proof that the only reason for that person's disease was smoking, is scientifically challenging to do. It has gotten easier and easier, but it is the reason that the tobacco industry has never seriously been held as accountable as they should. And it's all part of a tactic that makes a lot of sense. And here's a tobacco industry document. And this, is, this document really says an enormous amount. To paraphrase General Patton, for those of you who are, are not American, he was a famous World War II general who was known for literally causing massive terror everywhere he went. Um, to paraphrase General Tatton, the way we won these cases was not by spending all of R.J. Reynolds' money, but my, by making that other son of a bitch spend all of his. In other words, if you're going to sue me, I'm going to make it cost you a fortune, so you better be certain you're willing to do so. And very few individuals and very few lawyers 
are willing or able to take that account. So when I said to you before, the tobacco industry's marketing is based entirely on what can I get away with? How can I manipulate the system to get away with the most? Their defense of these cases is exactly the same thing. No compunction about telling the truth in any of these cases. So the first case that we actually saw that began to change things slightly, but only slightly, was a case brought in the United States in the 1980s by a, uh, first a woman named Rose Chipolone, and then after she died of lung cancer, her husband, um, in which um, she had lived as clean a life as one could conceivably imagine. You couldn't find a better person in terms of those sorts of things. She had a law firm that was prepared to spend literally millions of dollars to sue the tobacco companies and run the risk of doing so. Um, they took the tobacco industry, it was three different companies, um, took them through the most excruciating thing with regard to it. Every decision was appealed and appealed and appealed and literally made the plaintiff's lawyers spend tens of millions of dollars in defense of it. Rose Chipolone didn't win because they were able to create a minuscule sense of doubt whether her lung cancer was truly caused by smoking, although it clearly was. And then the second thing they did was argue that although she began smoking as a teenager, she had a lot of opportunity to quit. Remember the gummy bears analogy? Uh, well, you know, they made the same analogy for her. They made it very clearly. Millions of people have quit. Why wasn't she strong-willed enough to be able to quit? Um, despite the fact that we know now from documents that weren't available to Rose Chip alone, just how much they understood then about how powerfully addictive the nicotine in their products were and how they had actually manipulated the nicotine to make it even more powerful. But the Rose Chip alone case is important globally because it was the first case anywhere in the world that a judge had said, the plaintiff's lawyers are entitled to know what you knew. And therefore, the tobacco companies for the first time were required to produce what seemed like a lot of documents at the time, th roughly 380,000. And it was the first time that we had a window, the first time we could say with a degree of certainty, not only that they had to be lying, but that we knew that they were lying that the own internal documents at that point said clearly and explicitly their own chief scientific officers had known since the 1950s that their products caused cancer, had known since the 1960s that their products were addictive, um, and that they had targeted marketing campaigns to youth. In the, in the United States and in other, other countries, there's another set of cases that are out there in order to try to overcome the dollar cost, and that's called a class action. And that's where a lot of people in a very similar circumstance come together and bring a law, one lawsuit with one set of claims where the issues are literally identical. The United States allows those cases more than most. But here, too, the tobacco industry played the scor same scorched earth policy. And every time somebody brought one of those cases, they would find a way to argue why all thousand of the plaintiffs really weren't alike. They lived in different places. They had different life experiences. You, you name it. If you pay a lawyer enough money, they'll find a distinction between the two of you. There's only one of those. So despite the fact that in other areas, class actions have been fundamentally responsible in changing the behavior of businesses, corporations, and industries. In the United States, for example, basically class actions eliminated the use of asbestos, not the government, um, in that respect. Because once they approved that asbestos caused a different form of lung cancer, uh, the industry could no longer afford to do it. And that was the case in, in um, product after product after product, with only one exception, of course, tobacco. Those cases have never succeeded, with only one exception. Um, and that was a case that was brought by airline flight attendants. Um, you may not realize, because most of you have never flown on an airplane where people were still smoking. Um, but people used to smoke on airplanes. And flight attendants died from lung cancer at twice the normal rates as a result of that. Uh, people didn't realize that. So flight attendants actually led the charge, first in the United States, to ban smoking on airlines and brought a lawsuit with regard to that. Um, the good news was 
that after they brought this lawsuit, a number, and sadly I'm old enough to have worked on this, um, we worked um, in Congress and then with international bodies to get smoking banned on airlines. Um, and that was the case by the time this case ended. So this case ended with at least some payment, but not to the flight attendants. They refused to pay a penny to the flight attendants. But they did create a research fund which exists to this day and was helpful. Okay. There you go. So let me bring you to the only two sets of cases in the United States that have actually ever had a major difference. In 1994, um, a series of uh, the chief legal officers for different states in the United States brought suit against the tobacco companies. The cases brought by the state attorney generals were really the first time several different factors came in. One is the lawyers challenging the tobacco industry had as much money as the lawyers for the tobacco industry. Second, the state's claim wasn't that an individual's cancer was caused by it, but it was that the states, our state government, actually paid health care costs for individuals. And that therefore, if you were in a state and you had dramatically higher health care costs because of smoking rates, the state was paying literally billions of dollars in unnecessary health care costs. So the state said, we're bringing suit to recover those health care costs. And we don't have to prove that a person knew about the health risks of smoking or that the individual acted negligently. All we have to do is prove that you knew that, that it caused this disease. You sold it in our state. And therefore, you caused all this additional um, funding, uh, all these additional costs for us. The case began in 1994 after enormous amount of legal effort. It was settled in 1998 for what was then and still is the largest settlement ever against the tobacco industry. And I dare say it is the only case, only case ever, that actually resulted in a change in the behavior of the tobacco industry. So the first thing is the states did recover money. Um, and the recovery, if you calculated it over a 25-year period, um, was actually roughly, for all 50 states, roughly $250 billion. But the payments get made in perpetuity, so they keep getting made with regard to that. Uh, that sounds like a lot of money. Um, what did it result in? This, the tobacco companies were able to pay that judgment by raising the price of a pack of cigarettes by less than 20 cents. So huge payment as far as the states goes actually had a health effect because the price increase did result in a decrease in smoking. But it didn't devastate the bottom line of the tobacco companies. They showed massive profits the next year. The two good things about it is one, is it resulted in the largest disclosure of tobacco industry documents and a system for requiring continuing disclosure of those documents. And so much of what you read about the internal thinking about the tobacco industry results from the documents that were disclosed there and that are still maintained. And if you want to find them, you can go to the um, University of California, San Francisco Legacy Document Library. Um, and those documents continue to be updated to this date today. They also, for the first time, put serious restrictions on tobacco marketing in the U.S. Um, and prohibited targeting of the U.S., uh, uh, targeting of youth. There's a second major governmental case in the United States that's important and important to you. And that is the U.S. government, um, when Bill Clinton was president of the United States, filed suit against the major tobacco companies. They made the same basic claim which is that the, our central government was paying billions of dollars in excess health care costs as a result of tobacco industry sales and the death and disease they caused. For a variety of highly technical reasons, the tobacco industry was never required to pay damages. But in a 1,600-page decision by a federal judge, it is the most concise, even at 1,600 pages, thorough, detailed analysis of what the tobacco industry knew and what the tobacco industry did. So if you want solid documentation of when the tobacco industry learned about the death and disease its products caused, how it marketed to kids, how it tried to deceive the entire globe that light and low tar cigarettes were safer, uh, and how it went about deceiving the public and undermining public health laws, that decision is the place to go. It is the most thorough analysis ever. 
with regard to that. That decision came down in 2006. In the end, the only thing the judge was allowed to um, require the tobacco companies to do was to um, publish what are called corrective statements. Publications saying, we knew about all these things and lied. However, it is 2015, and as a result of appeals by the tobacco industry, those statements nine years later still have not appeared. Um, by the time they appeared, people won't remember what the case was like. But an incredibly important case in that. So that the two cases that have made the biggest difference um, are cases within the United States, and they were both brought by governments rather than individuals in order to change the industry's behavior. Which brings me to the fact that all too often, the courts have been the weapons of the tobacco industry, not the public. That's not the way it should be, but it has been the way it is. And why is that? Because the tobacco industry has always seen the courts as the forum where money, powerful advocates, could often overwhelm government lawyers in the private sector. And if people weren't prepared to respond, and for too many years people weren't prepared to respond, it was a place where they could slow progress. So here you have um, Philip Morris. We will continue to use all necessary resources and where necessary litigation to actively challenge, quote, unreasonable, that's unreasonable in the mind of Philip Morris, regulatory proposals. Um, and that's the key lesson here. And it's a very important lesson for people covering tobacco because it's only been in the last couple of years that the public health community has realized that unless we're prepared to help governments go toe to toe with the tobacco industry, the tobacco industry will use the courts in order to undermine government regulation on tobacco. You know, the most recent example that many of you have probably have seen, as, as we have seen a dramatic growth of stronger, graphic, larger health warnings. The first, frankly, frankly, the first health warnings that really do make a difference. We've also seen an explosion of the tobacco industry lawsuits against countries that initiate those health warnings. You know, in the United States, uh, um, our Congress required warnings covering 50% of the front and back of a tobacco product. Six years later, they're not on there because of tobacco industry litigation. Um, Uruguay is the second case, and I'll talk about Uruguay because after Uruguay um, increased the size of their health warnings to 80%, the tobacco industry not only sued them in Uruguay, but when the Uruguay Supreme Court found in favor of the government, they sued them before an international trade tribunal, a new tactic that's there. And then much more recently, we've seen, you know, in a very positive way, the real explosion of good graphic warnings in Sri Lanka, Thailand, Nepal, Jamaica, and Turkey. Every one of them has been sued. Uh, now, the good news is, in most of them, um, the warning labels have gone on. But the, the lesson is, is that many governments have been intimidated into not acting because they weren't prepared to defend these kinds of lawsuits, which is why it is vitally important. The tobacco industry, unlike others, wants to win, but they care less about winning and more care more about using the threat of the lawsuits to intimidate countries into inaction. And that's a fundamental theme. So we see them bring cases in all sorts of situations. And I could have picked dozens, so if I've left your country out, I apologize. Or if I've highlighted your country, I apologize in that case. You know, India, um, the original Katpa, the Indian National Tobacco Control Law um, banned point of sale advertising. They went into a lower court um, in Mumbai, found a single judge to issue a stay to prevent it from going into effect. At the time, the government of India didn't even defend it. Um, and that delayed implementation of that for over a decade until a new Indian government with support of non-governmental organizations came in, provided assistance, and got the stay thrown out. India's innovative uh, restrictions on smoking in films and requirements of disclosures was initially thrown out and then slowed down by litigation with regard to it. Costa Rica, um, and again, you'll see some things because they, they're often careful in that they challenge countries they don't think can defend them. You know, after a new comprehensive law was passed with a broad majority, um, the tobacco industry sued challenging the procedures by which it was debated and voted on, although nobody 
on the minority party as well as the majority party had objected to any of those issues. Fortunately, the court found no procedural or substance in defects. But the lesson to countries around Costa Rica was clear. Bring, uh, pass a strong tobacco control law, expect to get sued. Canada, um, there is a series of older cases in Canada uh, with regard to that. Canada has twice had to pass bans on advertising and promotion. Why? Because the first time after lengthy litigation it was thrown out, um, and only later, um, after literally almost a decade of delay, uh, they passed a new law and successfully were able to defend it. In a country less committed to tobacco control, that initial defeat would have accomplished what the tobacco industry wanted. But even with the second loss, they succeeded in delaying the implementation of bans on tobacco advertising and marketing, again, by almost a decade in that. During that same period of time, people may not realize, Canada was really the first country to talk about doing what Australia late did more recently, plain packaging. But the threat of lawsuits by the tobacco industry got the Canadian government to back off on that. So it didn't happen. Norway, same thing. Um, bans on point of sale, advertising, display, sued, sued in the EU courts, lengthy litigation. Um, a country less committed than Norway would have backed off. Fortunately, they didn't. You had several years of delay, but it has finally moved forward with regard to that. And then we move into a whole new range. And this is the era that you're seeing today that is receiving the most prominence. And it is very, very important. And that is, for the first time, the tobacco industry, um, on advice by a lot of lawyers who, who clearly said to their clients, we're beginning to lose all of these cases in the local courts. Because people are doing it smart. Um, there's a framework convention on tobacco control that not only authorizes them, but mandates that they pass laws banning advertising and marketing. And therefore, there's one forum that no one has ever, none of these countries have any experience in that is very expensive where local domestic laws won't count. And that is the international trade arena. International trade arena is governed by three different sets of, of kinds of agreements. There's the World Trade Organization, where countries all have come together um, and signed agreements on how they will try to open up the marketplaces between them. Um, but those agreements go way beyond just simple not having tariffs and barriers. And then a lot of, a lot of countries have signed regional free trade agreements um, in which they shockingly um, not only give their other countries the right to challenge actions, they give companies that invest in those countries the right to challenge actions in the international trade arena. And then third, individual free trade agreements, um, agreements between two, two different countries. Um, I'm Uruguay, uh, I'm Australia, I'll give you a better example. I'm Australia, um, I enter a free trade agreement with Hong Kong. Actually, before Hong Kong was turned back to China, Australia was trying to defend its corporations in case something happened as a result of that. Um, in that, it, not only did it give Hong Kong and Australia the right to sue each other, it gave companies that invest in those countries the right to sue the country. And, but to sue them not in their home courts where the domestic rules apply, but to sue them in international trade tribunals which, frankly, nobody in the public health community ever heard of before Philip Morris sued um, Uruguay in 2010. Um, so there are three major cases that I want to highlight there um, because they're important both for their specific substance and they're important because they are part of the tobacco industry's most recent strategy to try to intimidate countries into not taking strong action. The first is a case that was brought by Indonesia against the United States. In 2009, the United States passed a law that banned um, the use of, of flavorings in cigarettes. Uh, we were beginning to have all sorts of flavors in our cigarettes um, with regard to that, with one exception, and it's, it gave a regulatory body the authority to take a look at menthol cigarettes with regard to it for a variety of reasons that related solely to the number of people who use them and they're concerned about suddenly withdrawing them. Indonesia sued, saying that it discriminated against Indonesia's clove cigarettes which were smoked by a minuscule percentage of Americans. 
so not enough to actually justify the cost. But it was funded by the tobacco industry, and it was designed to upset the American law. And, in, and it was brought um, in an action before the World Trade Organization. So it wouldn't be American judges who would, who would see it, who would analyze American law. It would be three arbitrators appointed um, through the WTO to do that. Um, and in fact, after several years of litigation, uh, the court ruled that, in, that despite the fact that our Congress and ministry, uh, the equivalent of our Ministry of Health having determined that there was a public health rationale for what they did, these three arbitrators overrode that public health rationale and say it disproportionately affected clove cigarettes from Indonesia and ordered the United, and ruled in favor of Indonesia. Now, that's important um, because it's a dangerous precedent. The United States basically said to Indonesia, we really don't care what the court said, um, and ended up um, reaching a resolution in which we didn't change our behavior. But it's only a couple of countries that could threaten, could do that sort of thing and get away with it, as the US did. The two cases that are really important, Uruguay and Australia, and you're going to hear more about them throughout here. Um, um, in 2009, Uruguay passed a law that increased the size of its warning labels to 80% and also prohibited companies from having multiple versions of each different brand. Why did they do that? Because earlier they had banned the use of the terms light and low tar because light and low tar cigarettes really are not safer um, and they were concerned about the deception. Philip Morris International and the local Uruguayan tobacco company immediately changed the colors of its cigarettes that used to be light and low tar and began a marketing campaign so that every consumer would know that the cigarette that used to be light was now blue and ultra light was now silver um, and told the retailers to say, make sure when the customer comes in you tell them this so that they don't think that the light and low tar cigarettes have been withdrawn. The Uruguayan president, Tabaré Vasquez at the time, who was an oncologist, said you aren't getting away with that. Um, and therefore, we're going to increase the size of our warning labels so the colors will become less important. And we're going to tell you pick one version of each brand. So you can no longer have Marlboro, Marlboro Lights, Marlboro Ultralights, Marlboro Smooth. If you want one per version of Marlboro, pick it. Um, what happened was the day that Tabaré Vasquez stepped down as president and his successor was inaugurated, Philip Morris International filed a multi-billion dollar lawsuit against them not in the Uruguay courts, but um, in the International Court, the International Court for the Settlement of Trade Disputes, a division of the World Bank um, that, frankly, nobody in Uruguay had ever heard of. But it was the result of a free trade agreement between Switzerland and Australia. I mean, Switzerland and Uruguay um, that was there. And they mounted a public relations campaign and said to the Uruguayan public, as a result of the silliness of what this government has done, we're going to bankrupt your country. Um, and how are we going to bankrupt your country? Well, the reality is Philip Morris generates more in revenue every year than the entire economy of Uruguay does. And we're prepared to spend it and drive you back into the dark ages as a result of that. Uruguay is a country of 3.2 million people. Philip Morris International had 12% of the market. Think about it. It didn't, have a, it didn't have enough of a stake in the Uruguayan government to justify on a reg, normal basis the cost of this. But it was sending a message to the entire world. You mess with us and we're going to crush you. Um, and that was the message to low and middle income countries around the globe. The good news part of the story is that while Uruguay initially almost settled the case and rescinded the laws, in the end, as a result of assistance offered by Bloomberg Philanthropies, I'm proud to say, in the international community, Uruguay said, this is bigger than us. And with global support, we are prepared to stand up to the big guy uh, with regard to it. And the international community helped them find a law firm to represent them, um, found them experts who would work for them for free. Um, worked um, with the WHO and got resolutions passed by countries across the globe in support of them. And the good news is that case is still going on. And I, by the time we come back to the next World Conference, actually by next spring, 
that'll be decided. And I'm willing to bet my bottom dollar that Uruguay not only wins, but triumphs broadly and continues to move forward. And the good news is, the result is, Uruguay kept its policy in place and has seen a dramatic reduction in tobacco use in the country as a direct result of it. Philip Morris got more than they bargained for here, but only, but only because the global community came to the aid of this country. And that's a very important thing for you to understand with regard to that. And then in 2011, um, Australia, which has one of the best track records of taking measured steps time after time after time to reduce tobacco use. In response to the tobacco industry's efforts to thwart every one of those steps, finally in 2011, when progress had been stalled, not only increased their tax, but then went to what we call plain paper packaging. If you, any of you have seen the Australian packages, they're anything but plain. Um, what, that, what it means is that cigarettes can only be sold in Australia in packages that are brown. It actually started out olive brown, and the olive growers objected. Um, they didn't want to be associated with cigarettes. Um, brown, no logos, the name of the brand is typed, and it has a warning label covering 85% of the package. So that a cigarette pack in Australia no longer carries any of the cachet that appeals to kids as a direct result of that. Um, Philip Morris responded immediately, and they sued them in three different places there. The first is under the domestic courts, claiming that this amounted to taking of Philip Morris International's um, trademark, the Marlboro logo, on it. Um, that case went all the way up to the Australian High Court, which is their highest court, um, in a ruling where there was only one dissent, a resounding victory for the Australian government, and said, we're not using your logo at all. All we're doing is preventing you from using your logo to appeal to kids around the country. Second, Philip Morris Asia then sued in one of these investor cases. What they did was they took the trade agreement between Australia and Hong Kong, which Australia, in retrospect, I think, would say foolishly, entered into in order to protect their countries when Hong Kong was turned over to China. Um, and they sued them, saying, what you've done is illegally diminish the value of our investment in Australia because our brands are no longer worth as much as they used to be worth. And that case is going on. There are three arbitrators. It is in a different, it's a UN arbitration panel with rules that are as arcane that operates basically in secret behind closed doors with three arbitrators chosen by the parties who aren't really responsible to anybody um, nobody in this room could name any of them, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, on that, that will decide that case. That case has an important, interesting twist. And that was that Philip Morris Aust um, Asia only bought Philip Morris Australia after the Australian government announced that they were going to do plain paper packaging. Because if it was just a domestic company, it couldn't take advantage of the international trade laws. So what they had to do was acquire their local subsidiary, in essence, just to be able to claim that as an international company, they were being injured as a result of that. Australia has challenged that, the very fact of them being allowed to bring it, and that is now pending, and that should be resolved. Hopefully, that will be resolved later this year with regard to that. That case won't go further if Australia wins. It will if they don't. But then they brought another case, um, and that before the World Trade Organization. Um, somebody mentioned to me that there's a um, representative from Ukraine here. Is that? Okay. Okay. Ukraine sued Australia, um, claiming that Australia's plain paper packaging um, harmed its interests and its interest in trademarks. Understand something. Ukraine has never done any biz tobacco business with Australia ever. Ever. Um, and as much respect as I have for Ukraine as a country, it is not a country that's known for protecting global trademarks, exactly. So one can only ask what happened. Nobody in the, the Ministry of Health actually even knew the lawsuit was being filed when it was filed. Um, and what we have subsequently learned is that the lawsuit is being funded 100% by Philip Morris International. The Ukraine is being represented by Philip Morris International lawyers. 
uh, in there. They simply found a country willing to do its bidding for it in order to threaten there. They've subsequently gotten four other countries to do the same thing. Um, several of them have, are doing no business, to, no tobacco business with Australia, but that's really irrelevant to them. All of them are being funded by the major tobacco companies, either Philip Morris International or British American Tobacco. That case has already become the most complex, most involved, and before it's over, my guess will be the most expensive World Trade Organization litigation dispute in history. It is the, reason, it is the tobacco industry's effort to ensure that countries don't adopt plain paper packaging not because those companies are being discriminated against, but clearly because of the concern they have that if Australia gets away with it, countries around the globe will do it. And it has worked. It has worked. Um, country after country has looked at this as part of their tobacco control plan. And until Ireland several weeks ago um, became the second country to adopt plain paper packaging, and until the UK later today, I hope, um, becomes the third country um, when the House of Lords votes on, on the proposal, they have succeeded for putting off this innovative tobacco control measure for at least four more years. And we've worked with probably another half dozen countries, low and middle income countries, that want to do it, but that are afraid to do it because they don't have the resources to defend themselves in the international trade arena with regard to that issue. So. Um, let me suggest to you, um, because of the importance of these, these issues, um, that um, I don't know how many of you intend to attend the award ceremony that Bloomberg Philanthropies is holding Wednesday. Um, but let me encourage you to do that, because um, Mike Bloomberg will be there. And Mike Bloomberg and Bloomberg Philanthropies and Bill, Gate, Bill and Melinda Gates have been nothing short of spectacular in their willingness to help these countries that have been challenged. Um, and um, although it won't be public till then, he will have an announcement about that to demonstrate that ongoing and important commitment so that the tobacco companies don't continue to misuse the international trade system in that way. Long story short, you are not dealing here with a normal industry. Um, whatever else you think about capitalism, other industries simply don't behave in the same way as this, as this industry does. The product is different. The uh, mindset of the industry is different. The behaviors in which they have engaged are different. And as a direct result of that, um, how we have to respond to these issues in order to get simple, common sense public health measures passed and move forward um, has become absolutely different. What it means, in many respects, is that you're attending a public health conference but the solution to tobacco control goes well beyond public health. The tobacco industry has been willing to use every tool available to it to delay, to deceive, and to stand in the way of progress. Only when we stand up to them and take our se ourselves understand the importance of public education, working with the media to ensure that the public is truly informed and understanding not just about the harms of the product, although that's still critically important. Um, and, and you'll see it at, at a briefing that the World Heart Foundation is doing later this week, that an extraordinary number of people still don't actually understand the full scope of the harms of tobacco, but also understand the behavior and to hold public officials accountable because the tobacco industry is able to get away with what it does only, only by engaging in the kind of tactics we've seen here in the courts and by using its financial resources with public officials to intimidate them into inaction as well. I have a basic question uh, from your experience. By the way, it was extremely fascinating, I must admit. The presentation was very, very good. Thank you. Uh, from your experience, could you tell us which of the uh, penalties do they prefer? Do they prefer plain packaging to uh, gruesome warning packaging, or which one do they prefer? Uh, because, you know, I believe plain packaging totally rips them off their uh, branding opportunity. The gruesome uh, warning is probably more off-putting 
but they still get to put their brand on that packet. So just a curious thing. I don't think it's an either or. I think countries should do both, to be perfectly honest with you. What we have learned is, and it becomes particularly important, as you move into low and middle income countries and you're dealing with a population that is increasingly poor, and in many countries, illiterate, um, that the only kind of warnings that will work are those that um, show pictures portraying the death and disease. The second thing about plain pack, about p uh, graphic warning labels that's important is that even in countries where people understand that smoking causes disease, they underestimate the relative risk. Um, and the graphic warnings portray this in a way um, that dramatically increases people's understanding of just how dangerous tobacco is. And in some cases, um, makes them aware that tobacco doesn't only kill, um, it disfigures and causes pain as well. And it's interesting, but most people are less afraid of death than they are living um, a life of extraordinary pain and disfigurement. And the second, though, is I think the tobacco industry is terrified of plain packaging, and they're terrified for two reasons. Um, first is that it truly eliminates their opportunity to create an image with young people. So what we've seen in Australia is we've seen a, a, an effect on adult smoking, but the greatest effect that we've really seen is on youth uptake. And so that'll take longer to translate into large numbers, but given the industry's recognition of the importance of replacement smokers, if there's no cachet to, to these packages, it's not going to take all that many years before they don't have those replacement smokers. There's a second phenomenon that's not yet documented, but that I think is beginning to happen in Australia. And that is, there were, there were early stories of smokers saying, you know, my cigarette no longer tastes as good. Because um, once you strip the image off the taste, it just doesn't taste as good. Um, the second thing that's happened as a result of that is that the sale of the most expensive cigarettes, the premium cigarettes, which are the high profit cigarettes, have gone down. So as many things that have happened over the globe in terms of reducing tobacco use, tobacco industry profits never go down. Um, it's, it's a great product. It costs almost nothing to make. It's addictive. You get someone as a kid and you got them for 40 or 50 years. Um, if people will only buy the cheapest brands, that means it becomes another commodity. Um, the industry has a lot less money to spend on the kind of litigation in public relations and lobbying. So plain packaging long term, I think, has an extraordinarily important potential with regard to it. But it's not an either or. Australia did it right. Large warnings and plain packaging. Thank you.